Four friends quickly made their way through the forest thickets. The place marked on the map should be close. A week ago, Mishka called everyone and announced an urgent collection. They say he found something worthwhile. When everyone had gathered, Mishka, with a triumphant expression, pulled out a tattered and yellowed piece of paper. Here, bargained from a drunken deacon. What is this? Vitka was fiddling with the paper on the table, trying to make sense of the blurry symbols. Carefully, the map was drawn up before the revolution. Look, this is the abandoned village of Veseltsi, and this is a river. It's very narrow. It flows into the Vishera, upstream, a day's journey, and there will be a temple. This drunken monk told me that behind the temple, before the revolution, there was a pagan temple, and there, in the basements of the temple, treasures were buried. Cool, Micah. But where are the guarantees that we will find something there? Gray has always been a skeptic. What's the difference? Let's find it. Our luck. If we don't find it, let's take a walk through the historical places of the Urals. We were planning a hike anyway. The guys were happily discussing the hike. Only Pasha was silent, thoughtfully staring at the map. Pashka, what are you doing? I heard from an old hunter that there is a lot of devilry in these upper reaches. Even huntsmen are afraid to stick their nose there. Friends laughed at Pashkin's fears, accusing him of superstition, and began to develop a plan for the hike. Dusk began to deepen when four friends emerged from the thicket of the forest into a round clearing. Strangely, there was almost no grass growing in this place. The cracked earth was without a single trace of man or beast. There were six boulders around the clearing. The flat sides of the boulders were facing inward. It was decided, by a majority vote, to put up tents right in the clearing. Pasha, the only one, was against it, citing the probable sanctity of this place. But, as always, the others laughed off his concerns. We pitched tents and lit a fire. The fire illuminated the clearing, but behind the boulders, the darkness thickened more and more as night fell. I remembered. Earthcat, Pasha said thoughtfully. What are you talking about, old man? The locals have a legend. Earthcats protect treasures from idiots like us. Why, Earthen? She lives underground. Pashka, your cat sucks. Remember something really scary. You want to tickle your nerves. Guys, did you hear? What is this? A strange sound. Unlike anything else, struck their ears and disappeared into the silence of the night. The guys fell silent. Gray, quietly, moved the axe towards him. They sat in silence for a minute. The sound did not repeat. The guys started talking again, although not as cheerfully as before. Suddenly, again, this strange sound wedged itself into the background of their voices, only it was closer. It sounds like a howl. It's like it's coming from underground. Maybe wolves. Pashka? What did you tell us? This was not the first time for friends to go looking for treasure. They are used to spending the night in the forests. But now, for the first time in their lives, sticky fear began to squeeze them with icy paws. I warned you, boys, said Pashka, looking around and moving behind the boulder. He took a couple of steps into the darkness, waited until his eyes adjusted to the darkness. There are two strong trees nearby. Let's climb on them and wait out the night. I feel like this won't end well. This time they didn't make him laugh, but they weren't in a hurry to climb the trees either. The friends sat quietly near the fire, sometimes, in a low voice, inserting some phrases. Nobody wanted to drink tea anymore. And suddenly, again, this time, everyone clearly heard the sound, either a howl or a roar. It really came as if from underground, and it seemed that the earth itself was vibrating and shaking from its power. Without saying a word, the guys rushed into the darkness towards the trees that Pashka was pointing at. And like sparrows, they flew up, taking refuge among the branches, not paying attention to the scratches and abrasions that they received. Silence. Another two minutes passed. The guys clearly saw their campsite. The tents were lit by a cheerful fire. Suddenly, the light of the fire began to fade. No, the guys saw that the fire was not going out. Its tongues were also consuming dry branches, but it was as if they began to look at their camp through dark glass. Then the guys felt the trees shaking. The earth began to vibrate and hum. 
It felt like it was about to burst from the tension. The guys were so scared that they pressed themselves into the trunks even more. And after that, in the glow of the dying fire, they saw something. Thin streams of black darkness stretched towards the clearing. And in this darkness, a silhouette began to emerge. The creature was elegant and creepy at the same time. Yes, it was a cat, only huge like a tiger, and she glowed. But the light came from inside her, from her eyes, from her ears, from under her fur, highlighting her ribs and spine. The creature took full form in the middle of the clearing. She began to look around wildly at the tents and things and howl. The howls were similar to those of a cat, only much more creepy. The fire had already completely gone out and the frightened guys, only by the reflections of light emanating from the creature, could follow its movements. It rushed across the clearing. The crunch of broken things and the crack of torn fabric could be heard. The guys did not understand well what was happening. The mystical horror paralyzed them so much that they thought only about one thing, how to survive. Then, the creature stopped and raised its head, looking at the guys. Yes, it was looking exactly at them. No branches could hide them from the fiery and furious gaze of the guard. She approached the boulders without taking her eyes off the trees, but did not leave the clearing and let out a wild roar full of rage. The guys simply felt with their skin that this creature was ordering them to get out and never come back. Then, the lights of the earthen cat began to fade and it disappeared into the darkness. The grey morning began to disperse the night shadows and fears. The guys, little by little, began to come to their senses. When, with grief in half, they descended from the trees, they discovered that the clearing in the middle of the boulders had been completely cleared. All their belongings were broken and torn and thrown far over the boulders. The ground in the clearing was the same as before their arrival, cracked, without a single trace of man or beast. Without trying to collect their things, on shaky legs, the friends walked back towards civilization. Two of them, Vitka and Siri, turned grey. Mishka isolated himself from everyone and began to drink from the bottle. Only Pashka felt good. He, the only one, was inspired by what he saw. After all, over the years of researching the legends of the Urals, he was able to see something with his own eyes. My friends and I thought for a long time about how to spend the weekend. The decision came somehow by itself. Shouldn't we go into the forest to pick mushrooms? Well, said and done. Fortunately, it was the best season for mushroom pickers. And so early on Saturday morning we found ourselves in the forest. They immediately dispersed, agreeing to periodically give each other voice signals. I somehow had no luck from the very beginning, as if mushrooms, seeing me from afar, scattered and hid. But then a clearing appeared before my eyes. Small, I would even say tiny, surrounded by trees. To the left of the clearing, I noticed a pile of branches, twigs and fallen leaves, which for some reason immediately seemed strange to me. It was somehow too neat, as if made artificially. However, I had no time for this at all, because under one of the trees I saw the treasured mushrooms. The same wonderful find awaited me under the second tree and under the third. Having collected everything I could, I moved on, but after a few minutes I somehow ended up in that clearing again. I, like most city residents, am not a very experienced mushroom picker. That's what I attributed my return to. I thought about this for the third time, when it's unclear how, having again described a lap of honor, I returned to that same place again. However, when this happened for the fourth time, I wanted to swear loudly and obscenely. In order not to disturb the silence of the forest, I restrained myself and prepared to walk away from here again. But that was not the case. Something was holding me tightly by the hood from behind. Upon closer inspection, it turned out to be just a tree branch that I managed to get caught on. I remembered that my older sister jokingly said something about how if this happens, there is no need to rush to leave. You definitely forgot something. But what could I forget in this clearing in the middle of the forest? Smiling to myself, I somehow freed myself, because the branch held me so tightly and wandered off to look for friends. Very soon we all gathered together. While discussing my progress with my comrades, 
I automatically put my hand in my pocket to take out cigarettes. They were there, but the beautiful new lighter that my best friend had recently given me was gone. As the only smoker in the company, I knew very well that no one would be able to light a cigarette. And there was absolutely no desire to leave a gift dear to my heart in the forest. There was nothing to do. Asking the guys to wait, I went in search of a lighter. For some reason, my first thought was that I had lost her not just anywhere, but precisely in my favorite forest clearing. And this, imagine, turned out to be true. My surprise was boundless when I saw my loss lying on top of the same pile of branches that I had noticed a little earlier. Of course, I was delighted with the find. However, soon the joy gave way to a kind of stupor. How could I drop the lighter in that place? After all, I didn't even get close to this bunch. Deciding to ignore this fact, I bent down to pick up the little thing. And only then did I see something that I am unlikely to ever forget. From under a heap of sticks and dried leaves, someone's fingers were sticking out. My frightened friends came running to my wild cry. Everyone crowded around the terrifying discovery in bewilderment. Finally, Vitek, the most determined of us, moved the branches away. We saw the body of a young girl. The poor girl's body lay in a shallow hole, lightly covered with earth. The girls almost screamed in unison. One of the guys felt bad. Later, at the police station, we learned that the deceased's name was Elena. She was only 22 years old, and her family had been looking for her for a week. Later it turned out that Elena was killed by her young man, either her fiancé or her common-law husband, in the heat of a quarrel. Realizing what he had done, the guy took the girl to the forest, put her in a dug hole and covered her with branches. To this day, remembering that terrible incident, I shudder. I sincerely feel sorry for this girl, so young and so absurdly dead. And I still couldn't understand what happened on that Saturday afternoon. All these were simple coincidences. Or was it the deceased who asked not to leave her alone in the cold autumn forest? I heard this unusual story at the station from a stranger, and this story and this village will remain in my memory forever. It's the end of February, winter is not going to retreat, a strong snowstorm is raging outside, the frost is chilling to the bones. Huddled from the cold, I run into the station building, trying to find an empty seat at a table, because my train was mercilessly delayed, and I sadly realize that there is almost nowhere to sit. There is only a modest place at the table by the window, opposite a very sad man. Free? I ask, to which the man nods affirmatively and continues to look out the window. I sit down opposite, take off my gloves, and warm up. The man continues to sit, he clearly doesn't want to talk to me, although to be honest, I don't like empty talk either. We sit like this for a long time, people come and go, rush somewhere about their everyday business. But we remain at this damned station, waiting for the train that will take us away from here. At some moments, I notice irritation on the face of my unfortunate neighbor, mixed with slight motes of anxiety, and finally he begins to speak. When will she arrive, huh? This man says questioningly and irritably. Are you late? I asked, noticing some desperation in his voice. No, I'm not late, the man answers. I'm running. I'm running from here. I looked at him in a new way. Lights of interest sparkled in my eyes. He was a middle-aged man, maybe about forty, very thin and clearly not entirely healthy. He constantly ran his fingers through the collar of his already worn and slightly dirty black coat, constantly looked around, and from time to time he took off his glasses and rubbed his eyes, as if from fatigue. He noticed that I was interested in his last phrase, took a flask out of my pocket, took a sip of something warming, silently handed it to me, but I refused. You know, I'll never see you again, the stranger said, sniffing his sleeve. You couldn't find a more ideal interlocutor. Maybe this is fate, 
Maybe it's you who I have to tell everything at this station. And so begins the story of the stranger, which I will reproduce from memory. I will try not to forget anything, to convey to you everything that now turns out to be in my possession and that lies like a heavy stone on my soul. A heavy stone of obscurity and darkness. My name is Ivan, although this is not particularly important. Once upon a time, I escaped from the big city, away from the bustle and crowds of people, into a very cozy village. I wanted to change something in my life after the death of my first and only wife. Actually, I ran away, and now I'm not sure that it was the right decision. Our village is small, consisting of 23 houses, which includes my house. Not far from this province, right next to the approaching forest, our settlement stands has been standing for many, many years. It's not thriving, but it doesn't seem like it's going to die, and will never die. I know this for sure. We all knew each other in the village. We lived happily, amicably, and we never could have imagined that someday something would change. That someday we would turn the page of tranquility, behind which there would be real madness, which is impossible to imagine. Recently, one of our neighbors, Dmitry Filipovich, began to bother us. He was a very respected person, worked at the university, and was an honored teacher. He lived with his wife. He was already approaching 60, and so was his wife. In general, he was no different from everyone else. We talked with him often, spent Fridays together. He himself was a very good person. He could listen and tell something interesting about science. But, a year ago, we had to gather as a whole village at the funeral of Philippic's wife. She died from a serious illness. There was no chance. Unfortunately, well, come in, if anything happens, we'll talk. I said then when we stood in front of his wife's cross. I, like no one else, understood him. I myself was once in such a situation, without acquaintances and friends. It's not easy to come to terms with loss. Vanya, he said very quietly, you can't talk here. Actually, Philippic has now completely changed. He closed himself off and from now on I saw him only in the morning, when he left for work, and in the evening, when he returned from work. I came to him a couple of times, trying to get him to talk, to console him, but, unfortunately, it didn't work. So soon, Philippic stopped going to work. Now I only saw him in the store, and the rest of the time he was in the house. But it was not about him now, but about his late wife. Exactly forty days had passed since the death of Philippic's wife. It was a quiet winter evening. Everyone was already getting ready to go to bed. And then, somewhere around eleven, something happens that absolutely everyone believed in except me. The ghost of Philippic's wife appears. I go to bed, indulge in sweet dreams, and suddenly the dream changes dramatically. Something bad, frightening, and terribly interesting interferes. I'm having a nightmare. It's as if I'm walking past a cemetery. It's already evening. A snowstorm is blowing. I hear some barely audible voices among the gusts of wind. Voices from the cemetery, if anything. So, in fact, I continue to walk further, speed up, and suddenly someone behind me says my name, quietly, but I heard it clearly. I stop. Panic suddenly shoots through me, because I recognized the voice. It was Masha, Philippic's wife. I turn and see her in front of me. Yes, exactly her. She, translucent, in the same clothes in which she was buried, stands among the trees and just looks at me. I notice a strange panic in her gaze, and suddenly she begins to say, I won't stay with you. I recoiled a little, not yet realizing that this was a dream and shaking with fear I told her that she should come to her husband to say goodbye. Why should she come to me? I'll come to him and everyone. But I won't stay, answered Masha, and disappeared, dissolving among the trees. And then I woke up. You must understand, I never believed in those forty days, but then, lying in bed after this nightmare, I could not come to my senses. Everything was so obvious, so realistic, but I didn't believe it. However, in the morning everything changed. 
Today in a dream, Masha came to say goodbye. She said that she wouldn't stay, my neighbor said, sitting on the bench. Her friend answered her. Come on, how can that be? To me too. Near the cemetery, among the trees, she said she would come to everyone. Looks like I didn't deceive you. I was simply shocked. How the hell is this? I asked everyone. And guess what? Everyone dreamed about her. Everyone, do you understand? And I told everyone the same thing. I won't stay. Philip, you already know everything, right? I asked my friend when I came to him that evening to tell him my nightmare. I thought that he would be surprised, even happy, but he was not particularly happy. Yes, I know, the neighbor answered with a sigh. I came. But you know, she speaks without understanding, does not realize anything. Sometimes, you know, I tell her, let's go, we'll buy you a phone, a good one, a new one. But she refuses, says she doesn't need it. Well, then we come to the store, buy it, and then can't tear myself away from it. It will also be here too. Philippic's words sounded somehow strange in this emptiness and twilight of the evening, scattered, turned into something bad, into some strange hint that was so creepy that it made me shiver. What do you mean by this? I ask, and my voice trembles slightly. Everything will be fine, Vanya. Go home. It's already late. Philippic patted me on the shoulder and began to send me away. It was at that moment, when I had almost crossed the threshold, that I froze. From the twilight of the house, I heard a loud creaking sound, as if someone had stepped on old boards rotten from time to time. I stopped abruptly. It was as if a shower was pouring over me. I turned around and saw the neighbor's face, which was far from frightened. The neighbor was not afraid. He just looked at me in confusion and once again said that I had to go. I heard this unusual story at the station from a stranger, and this story and this village will remain in my memory forever. It's the end of February. Winter is not going to retreat. A strong snowstorm is raging outside. The frost is chilling to the bones. Huddled from the cold, I run into the station building, trying to find an empty seat at a table, because my train was mercilessly delayed, and I sadly realize that there is almost nowhere to sit. There is only a modest place at the table by the window, opposite a very sad man. Free? I ask to which the man nods affirmatively and continues to look out the window. I sit down opposite, take off my gloves, and warm up. The man continues to sit. He clearly doesn't want to talk to me. Although, to be honest, I don't like empty talk either. We sit like this for a long time, people come and go, rush somewhere about their everyday business, but we remain at this damned station, waiting for the train that will take us away from here. At some moments, I notice irritation on the face of my unfortunate neighbor, mixed with slight notes of anxiety, and finally he begins to speak. When will she arrive, huh? This man says questioningly and irritably. Are you late? I asked, noticing some desperation in his voice. No, I'm not late, the man answers. I'm running. I'm running from here. I looked at him in a new way. Lights of interest sparkled in my eyes. He was a middle-aged man, maybe about forty, very thin and clearly not entirely healthy. He constantly ran his fingers through the collar of his already worn and slightly dirty black coat, constantly looked around, and from time to time he took off his glasses and rubbed his eyes, as if from fatigue. He noticed that I was interested in his last phrase, took a flask out of my pocket, took a sip of something warming, silently handed it to me but I refused. You know, I'll never see you again, the stranger said, sniffing his sleeve. You couldn't find a more ideal interlocutor. Maybe this is fate. Maybe it's you who I have to tell everything at this station. And so begins the story of the stranger, which I will reproduce from memory. I will try not to forget anything, to convey to you everything that now turns out to be in my possession, and that lies like a heavy stone on my soul a heavy stone of obscurity and darkness. My name is Ivan, although this is not particularly important. Once upon a time, 
I escaped from the big city, away from the bustle and crowds of people, into a very cozy village. I wanted to change something in my life after the death of my first and only wife. Actually, I ran away, and now I'm not sure that it was the right decision. Our village is small, consisting of 23 houses, which includes my house. Not far from this province, right next to the approaching forest, our settlement stands has been standing for many, many years. It's not thriving, but it doesn't seem like it's going to die. And will never die. I know this for sure. We all knew each other in the village, we lived happily, amicably, and we never could have imagined that someday something would change, that someday we would turn the page of tranquility, behind which there would be real madness, which is impossible to imagine. Recently, one of our neighbors, Dmitry Filipovich, began to bother us. He was a very respected person, worked at the university, and was an honored teacher. He lived with his wife. He was already approaching 60, and so was his wife. In general, he was no different from everyone else. We talked with him often, spent Fridays together. He himself was a very good person. He could listen and tell something interesting about science. But, a year ago, we had to gather as a whole village at the funeral of Philippic's wife. She died from a serious illness. There was no chance. Unfortunately. Well, come in. If anything happens, we'll talk. I said then when we stood in front of his wife's cross. I, like no one else, understood him. I myself was once in such a situation, without acquaintances and friends. It's not easy to come to terms with loss. Vanya, he said very quietly, you can't talk here. Actually, Philippic has now completely changed. He closed himself off and from now on I saw him only in the morning, when he left for work, and in the evening, when he returned from work. I came to him a couple of times, tried to get him to talk, to console him, but unfortunately, it didn't work. So soon, Philippic stopped going to work. Now I only saw him in the store, and the rest of the time he was in the house. But it was not about him now, but about his late wife. Exactly forty days had passed since the death of Philippic's wife. It was a quiet winter evening. Everyone was already getting ready to go to bed. And then, somewhere around eleven, something happens that absolutely everyone believed in except me. The ghost of Philippic's wife appears. I go to bed indulge in sweet dreams, and suddenly the dream changes dramatically. Something bad, frightening, and terribly interesting interferes. I'm having a nightmare. It's as if I'm walking past a cemetery. It's already evening. A snowstorm is blowing. I hear some barely audible voices among the gusts of wind. Voices from the cemetery, if anything. So, in fact, I continue to walk further, speed up, and suddenly someone behind me says my name, quietly, but I heard it clearly. I stop. Panic suddenly shoots through me, because I recognize the voice. It was Masha, Philippic's wife. I turn and see her in front of me. Yes, exactly her. She, translucent, in the same clothes in which she was buried, stands among the trees and just looks at me. I notice a strange panic in her gaze, and suddenly she begins to say, I won't stay with you. I recoiled a little, not yet realizing that this was a dream, and shaking with fear I told her that she should come to her husband to say goodbye. Why should she come to me? I'll come to him and everyone, but I won't stay, answered Masha and disappeared, dissolving among the trees. And then I woke up. You must understand, I never believed in those forty days, but then, Lying in bed after this nightmare, I could not come to my senses. Everything was so obvious, so realistic. But I didn't believe it. However, in the morning everything changed. Today in a dream, Masha came to say goodbye. She said that she wouldn't stay. My neighbor said, sitting on the bench. Her friend answered her. Come on, how can that be? To me too. Near the cemetery, among the trees. She said she would come to everyone. Looks like I didn't deceive you. I was simply shocked. How the hell is this? I asked everyone. And guess what? 
Everyone dreamed about her. Everyone? Do you understand? And I told everyone the same thing. I won't stay. Philip, you already know everything, right? I asked my friend when I came to him that evening to tell him my nightmare. I thought that he would be surprised, even happy, but he was not particularly happy. Yes, I know, the neighbor answered with a sigh. I came. But you know, she speaks without understanding, does not realize anything. Sometimes, you know, I tell her, let's go, we'll buy you a phone, a good one, a new one. But she refuses, says she doesn't need it. Well, then we come to the store, buy it, and then can't tear myself away from it. It will also be here too. Philippic's words sounded somehow strange in this emptiness and twilight of the evening, scattered, turned into something bad, into some strange hint that was so creepy that it made me shiver. What do you mean by this? I ask, and my voice trembles slightly. Everything will be fine, Vanya. Go home. It's already late. Philippic patted me on the shoulder and began to send me away. It was at that moment, when I had almost crossed the threshold, that I froze. From the twilight of the house, I heard a loud creaking sound, as if someone had stepped on old boards rotten from time to time. I stopped abruptly. It was as if a shower was pouring over me. I turned around and saw the neighbor's face, which was far from frightened. The neighbor was not afraid. He just looked at me in confusion and once again said that I had to go. Already sitting at home, I could not put everything together. The atmosphere of night darkness began to envelop the village, creeping into me too, deeper and deeper. There couldn't have been anyone in Philippic's house, but there was still someone there. Masha didn't come to anyone else in the dream, but we won't even dream of peace again. Philippic will continue to behave strangely, avoid people, and stories about Mashka's soul that has not found peace will begin to spread throughout the village. Neighbors will begin to notice strange creaks of snow in the yard at night, and will begin to say that they see a strange figure in the semi-darkness of empty streets, a figure very similar to the dead Masha. And at some point I will see all this. It was getting dark. I sat thoughtfully in my house, thinking about Philippix's wife and himself, trying to calm myself down and ward off strange mystical thoughts forever. Did not look out. My worst fears came true very soon. It's about twelve o'clock, almost everyone is asleep. Only a strange picture emerges of Philippix's house. It seems to me that the door of his house opened slightly, quietly, so frighteningly and it seems that it has opened. It seems that nothing else is happening. But a minute later I see a certain figure who, with bare feet, in a dress that treacherously resembles the one in which Masha was buried, steps on the newly fallen snow. Yours, I say, get up and take a closer look. Yes, damn it, yes. I see a woman very similar to Masha. She quietly, shuddering at every step, walks across the yard, gets to the gate, opens it with a creak and walks along the barely lit street. I still don't fully believe. What I see doesn't inspire confidence, but what else can I trust? Masha walks very quietly along the road, stopping from time to time and looking around. She is getting closer, she is getting closer, along with primal fear and horror. Madness is rolling over me, overwhelming me, my heart is beating as if it will break out of my chest and roll into the grave, but she keeps going. Quiet, but purposeful. It's like he's choosing something. All someone. She is closer, she begins to open the gates, enters other people's yards, approaches the windows, looks at them for about a minute, then moves on. And now my gate creaks. Strong, disgusting. A ringing fear creeps through me. I move away from the window, forgetting that I didn't curtain it, but it's too late to approach. The snow creaks, the alarm bells ring in my head, and now I see her. Masha appears outside the window. Dead. This is her. I'm telling you for sure, but she seems to be alive. Her face is slightly blue, the circles under her eyes are almost black, and her eyes themselves are greenish almost glowing so bright. 
They look around my house and stop at me. She looks straight at me, her mouth stretches slightly in a smile, revealing yellow teeth, and freezes in this state. She raises her blue hand and begins to run her nails along the window, and her face seems to be frozen in one expression, not changing, already grinning. Masha, I suddenly say, not knowing what to say next. But I don't have to say anything, because in response I hear what I already guessed. You will talk to Masha in the next world. Don't you dare call me that, comes a bloomy voice from the yard, which I heard for the first time. Rough, masculine, scary. Something quickly pulls its hand down, scratches on the glass, turns around with a crunch and leaves, and I hear it saying the same phrase. Then I'll come, then I'll come. That night lasted forever for me. Without closing my eyes for a second, I wait for the morning, resolutely walk towards Philippic's house and knock on the door. Philippic walks slowly, I hear his steps, I hear muttering and discontent. What have you done, you old idiot? I greet him with a question from the threshold. I ask the question quietly so that it doesn't hear me. Philippic understands me, narrows his eyes, grabs me by the sleeve and drags me into the house. No one, you hear, no one. He repeats, doesn't let go, drags him further. You can't tell this to anyone. I found the ritual, did everything, everything worked out. Masha doesn't communicate with me yet, but she's already walking around the house. It's a miracle. It doesn't just walk around the house. I answer, I want to punch Philippic for doing such tricks, but he already led me to the door to the room, opened it with a creak and... In the room, against the wall, there is a dug-out empty coffin. Masha is lying on the bed, sleeping. I pull Philippic back, take him out into the yard, and yell at him. Are you stupid or something? Looks like an academician. Looks like he must have brains. Tell me where are your brains? Philippic laughs. He is glad. He doesn't believe that he didn't return Masha. I'll wake her up now. You'll see he says, goes into the house, and I run to hell to my room, close the door, I don't need this, I've already met her, I've had enough. Despite Philippic's persuasion and requests, I told everyone everything, and I didn't care whether they believed me or not. I immediately got ready, took all my things, drove here and waited for this damn train that would take me away from here. The stranger finished his story, took out a flask, drank more, offered it to me again, and this time I finally agreed. I understood that perhaps there was an inventor sitting opposite me or maybe a mentally ill person, but for some reason part of me didn't want to believe it. I have keys, says the stranger, takes out the keys to his house and hands them to me. I won't need them anymore, if you want, take them and check them. I refuse, the dispatcher apologizes for the inconvenience announces that the required train has arrived, and the stranger stands up, extends his hand to me, and says goodbye. You need to let go of your own dead, otherwise someone else's dead will come. Remember this. The dead must not be disturbed. These games don't end well. He leaves. I continue to think about everything, waiting for my train, which arrives next. I get up and notice the keys on the table. The stranger left them for me after all. Almost two years have passed since then. From time to time I remember that stranger and his story. I still can't understand whether it was true or a fantasy. I tried to find information about that very village. I found that same Philippic. Such a person really exists. Or rather, it was. Almost two years ago he died. An obituary was even posted on the Institute's website. The strange thing was that he died a week after the stranger's story. What he died from is not written there, and I won't be able to find out. Also, I found a strange-looking note in the local news. They wrote that somewhere nearby, sometimes people disappear. The devil knows whether the disappearances are connected with this village and what happened to the rest of the village residents. Of course, I can check, go. My keys are still in the top drawer of my nightstand waiting in the wings, but that time will not come.
I'm not going to take risks. I'd rather be left alone with my questions, because you can't disturb the dead, neither your own nor others. Otherwise, I won't be able to ask questions in this world.